Thank you to my Asbantium level patron Fallon Cortez for helping to support the channel. A T-Rex in the middle of the London Thames, an army of sinister clockwork robots stealing body parts, a man who doesn't know who he is anymore. No, this isn't the premise of some dark and twisted HP Lovecraft novel, this is actually the opening of Doctor Who's 8th series, an episode designed to shift the entire tone of the show towards a more high concept and serious style of storytelling under the stewardship of showrunner Stephen Moffat and new Doctor Peter Capaldi. Some fans hate it, but I think they couldn't be any more wrong. Deep Breath is a brilliant statement of intent, an episode that really changes everything about Doctor Who and challenges its audience to change their perspective on the main character and address their own biases. But how? What makes this episode so great? Well, that's partly why I took so long to make this video. That and getting burned out doing reviews. I wanted to do Deep Breath and the Capaldi era justice and that's what I hope to do starting with this very detailed analysis video. I mean, it's what I do best, isn't it? So, how long can you hold your breath? Because it's time to discover what makes Deep Breath such a brilliant piece of Doctor Who media. Hello, hello. Rubbish robots from the dawn of time. Deep Breath was the huge, feature-length start of a new era of Doctor Who. An exciting time for any fan because you find yourself wondering about all the interesting possibilities that lay ahead. It's arguably always the period of the show where there's the most discussion and excitement, since fans want to know every little detail. Of course, you could watch The Tea Man for the news, but you can never be a good old magazine with official exclusive information. I love to look at magazine coverage of Doctor Who to gain a better understanding of episodes on and off camera and the app Readly has really helped me with this. It has allowed me to access so many film and TV centric magazines I use to help me write these videos, especially because I can go back and look at past issues of magazines and read articles and reviews regarding the Capaldi era, so I can see how it was covered in the media at the time. Readly is an easy to navigate app, the interface is really helpful, you can find anything you want, whether that be brand new magazines, your local newspaper or even papers from entire other countries. Readly grants you instant access to over 6,000 and high quality magazines covering all kinds of hobbies and interests. And you can even take them on the go with offline reading, so you can download a bunch to read on a long journey. There's so much content and it's really accessible, so I highly recommend downloading it. And listen, you know your boy's got you covered. By clicking the link down in my description, you can get two months access completely free and you can cancel at any time. So why not try it out and enjoy a vast and varied virtual library right inside your phone? And hey, maybe it'll inspire you like it does for me with these videos. A big episode like this needs to immediately hook viewers with an impressive and dramatic set piece, which we see as a T-Rex appears in the middle of the Thames. It's interesting how this was pretty much the first thing Moffat developed for the episode, outside of the Matt Smith cameo at the end of course. He hadn't set any of his ideas into stone yet and had no concrete direction for the narrative, but he knew he could easily work this T-Rex stuff into whatever he came up with, and I think this leads it to being a fantastic and impactful way to kickstart the episode. It's kind of standalone in a fun way, with some nice comedy, like Jenny insisting she knows what dinosaurs look like, despite, you know, Vastra actually having been there in person. Because yeah, I think I'd be more likely to believe the prehistoric lizard woman than the human who saw an artist rendition in a textbook, although hopefully both of them agree that that whole feather stuff is dumb. Anyway, I digress. This opening is a good way to signal familiarity. When Deep Breath came out, viewers were taking a plunge of sorts because everything seemed so different, especially all the fans who came on board during the Smith era. The 11th Doctor era had essentially started with a clean slate. The 11th hour basically reset everything about the show without any familiar elements. Moffat needed to because it was important for him to put his stamp on the show and indicate his own direction independent of the baggage of the past. However, due to the significance of the change into the 12th Doctor, Moffat knew he had to emphasise familiarity and establish a feeling of safety for the audience, which this opening immediately does. Clara remains the companion, which is something we've seen before with Sarah Jane and Rose, along with others, helping to ease the transition. The episode is also set in the familiar location of Victorian London, and the Paternoster Gang are like units presence in the 3rd and 4th Doctor's first stories. It's quite funny how a Victorian crime-fighting duo, including a lizard woman and an 
alien clone warrior is what we consider familiar, but hey, I guess that's Doctor Who for you. And of course, we get the incredible premise of a dinosaur stomping along the Thames, which is very Doctor Who and reminds you that yes, this is the same show you know and love. Indeed, the T-Rex spits out that iconic blue box and we're off to the races. It's common in post-regeneration episodes for the new incarnation to just sleep it off for a bit, like we saw with the 3rd and 10th Doctors. However, a big criticism of the Christmas Invasion was just how long the Doctor spent sleeping it off, even if him being out of commission was kind of the point. I very much feel like Deep Breath attempts to remedy that criticism, as the Doctor only rests for a little bit before he's already clambering out of the window and onto the roof to talk to the dinosaur. This is another fun scene establishing the 12th Doctor's weirdness and eccentricity. It shows how alien he is, hearkening back to classic Doctors like Tom Baker and Patrick Troughton. Sadly though, the dinosaur is burned alive by the half-faced man, which results in a frantic chase to the crime scene scored absolutely wonderfully by Murray Gold. There's a triumphant feeling of action and frenzy with the heroic music blaring, reminding you of the action-packed nature of modern Doctor Who. It's another way to weave that reassuring sense of familiarity throughout the narrative. However, this thrilling chase soon gives way to the more ponderous narrative centering around Clara. Whilst the Doctor is off searching for the villain and taking clothes from the homeless, we follow Clara are trying to settle into the unfamiliar world and find things to do, other than, you know, getting hit in the face with the morning papers. You can really tell that the Paternosa gang have a specific and ordered way of life, so there's no real way for Clara to fit in, there's no role for her. She has a really good report of Strax, they play off each other really well, even if Moffat starts writing one-handed again. Uh, well, put your clothes back on. They are on. Oh yeah, so they are. Clara being separated from the Doctor also gives us lots of time to explore how she's struggling to deal with the regeneration. A lot of people take umbrage with Clara rejecting the Doctor's change, since she already knows about regeneration and has seen his previous incarnations. However, it makes complete sense. The 11th Doctor was her friend, that was her version of the Doctor. So even though she understands regeneration, that doesn't mean she'll be completely fine with seeing such a dramatic shift and never getting to see Eleven again. I mean, it's the same with fans, isn't it? Such a cynical smile. Clara had been with Eleven for so long, becoming used to all of his quirks and looking at his face every single day, so it's not something you can accept easily. Imagine if your dog suddenly became a parrot. It's the same brain, it's still your pet, but it's fundamentally different and now you have to get used to that. We saw it with Rose too, as she tried to adjust to the Tenth Doctor in the Christmas Invasion, because companions are audience surrogates, and they represent the viewer's own concerns and fears about the changes. Modern fans had grown so accustomed to young and handsome Doctors whizzing about and cracking one-liners with a goofy smile. The Twelfth Doctor is very different to that, so Moffat clearly knew he faced an uphill battle to keep those fans on board. Which is why Clara is so resistant to the change, because the fans were. And in my opinion, that's the true meaning of the title, Deep Breath. Because the episode is a dive into the unknown, a bold step into new territory, which is scary. But if you just take a deep breath and take that leap of faith, it will be okay and you can make it through. Although I guess that metaphor also means that Doctor Who fans are vicious robots, trying to forcibly become human at the cost of others. Sounds like Twitter to me. I usually don't like the way Moffat writes for Madame Vastra, since it's often that annoying sense of philosophical poetry and cringeworthy enigma that I truly hate about his writing. However, I really adore the scene as Vastra confronts Clara for not accepting the Doctor, because she's right, Clara is wrong. The Doctor is old, incredibly old. Just because 10 and 11 looked young doesn't mean the person underneath was. I wear a veil as he wore a face, for the same reason. If anything, 12 is more of a reflection of the character's true age and weariness. 11 was basically just what Clara wanted to see. It's another way for Moffat to try and win the audience over by making them understand the change. So many people instantly wrote off the 12th Doctor due to Peter Capaldi's age, the actor being one of the oldest to ever play the Doctor. But this is a 2000 year old Time Lord, he was old even in his first incarnation in the show. It's misguided to always expect the Doctor to be young and dashing, because all it would ever be is a mask to hide the age underneath. Moffat has a very deep and visceral understanding of the character, which means he understands all of this incredibly well. The scene is essentially he himself speaking through Vastra and putting the entitled fans in their place, which is very important. He trusted you. Are you judging him? 
Deep Breath is very much about Clara herself, addressing how badly she deals with the situation and how she learns not to be so vain and judgmental of this new doctor. And yes, let's talk about the 12th Doctor, who I think is immediately endearing from his very first appearance in this episode. He starts off really confused and bumbling around, but he retains a strong wit and charm. Oh! You're gonna die this all too! It's not the hyperactive, fizzing, youthful energy of his predecessor, but his charisma and eccentricity reminds you that this is the same person we've always followed. He's still a lovable goofball, just replacing the scatterbrained wackiness of the 11th Doctor with more of a sarcastic, dry humour and unapproachable alienness, especially because he doesn't really care what anyone thinks of him in a fun new direction for the character. But despite this change, his older age doesn't stop him getting into action-packed chases and fights, so the core of the character remains firmly in place. I really like Capaldi's take on the post-regeneration madness. Of course, this is a staple of these episodes. Whether it be eating fish fingers and custard or choking his companion, the Doctor has a habit of struggling to get their bearings after the change, with the 12th Doctor no different. I mean, don't look in that mirror! It's absolutely furious! Doctor, please! He's not madcap in the over-the-top, zany way, but he still has enough whimsy to execute this madness flawlessly. It's really fun as he thinks everyone else's accent has changed because he's Scottish now, along with him questioning the point of bedrooms, finding it impossible to get his head around decorating a room and putting stuff in there if you only ever sleep in there. These early scenes are crucial for maintaining the feeling of him being the Doctor. And I think it achieves this exceptionally, because he's such a fish out of water. I hate being wrong in public, everybody forget that happened. In a scene perfectly undignified and undoctor like the 12th Doctor starts rummaging through bins in a back alley and shouting at a homeless man. It's kind of surreal and funny because of how weird it all is. They probably want to seed from the rest of my face and set up their own independent state of eyebrows. However, the comedy is short-lived because it soon becomes about the familiarity of the Doctor's new face. Of course, as everyone knows, Peter Capaldi had previously appeared in both series Force Fires of Pompeii and Torch with Children of Earth, which I pretty much refuse to review at this point out of spite because of how often you lot ask for it. This isn't the first time lead actors had appeared before, with Karen Gillan and Freema Adjaman acting in the show before their casting and, more notably, Colin Baker appearing as the Time Lord Maxil during the fifth Doctor story Arc of Infinity. However, Peter Capaldi's roles in his two prior appearances were very prominent lead roles and the audience would obviously question such a familiar face being the Doctor now. So I like how Moffat acknowledges this, the Doctor trying to work out where his face came from. It's also good that we don't get proper answers just yet, the reveal only coming during Series 9. But this scene is perfect for setting up all these questions about the Doctor, introducing more mystery to him. We now have more questions about who he is, why he looks the way he does, and why he acts so abrasively. It reminds me a lot of how the Doctor was in Series 1, someone so conflicted and mysterious, with a companion trying to hang on for dear life and deal with this dangerous, yet charming and charismatic stranger. He is incredibly unpredictable, which adds a lot of intrigue and dramatic tension. He abandons Clara multiple times in the episode, and both times it's uncertain whether or not he'll even come back for her, so it makes the Doctor a mysterious and enigmatic person once again. We don't know anything about him anymore. This is what the ideal male body looks like. This is peak performance. It's weird to think that the production team even briefly considered having the 12th Doctor speak in an accent different to Capaldi's own Glaswegian. I know it worked for David Tennant, but I feel like there's no point hiring Capaldi if you aren't actually going to let him use his distinctive accent to run wild. So thankfully the team saw sense, especially because Capaldi wanted to draw upon his own personality when crafting the 12th Doctor's character, and he really does make the role his own. It perfectly blends the essential traditional elements of the character with Capaldi's own spin on the character he grew up watching. Because yes, Peter Capaldi was famously a long-time Doctor Who fan during the Classic Who era, and you can even see that in the 12th Doctor's costume. Capaldi took inspiration from the darker clothes of the first three Doctors, with he and costume designer Howard Burden working together to tone down the colourful zaniness of the 11th Doctor. The goal was to create a cohesive outfit without gimmicks like celery or a bow tie whilst also having the costume evoke multiple time periods, giving the Doctor a physical representation of how timeless they are and how they can fit in almost everywhere whilst still standing out. I think they more than achieved this goal, since he looks classy and distinguished without removing that otherworldly presence of the character. 
The T-Rex from the beginning gets roasted like a bad take on Twitter, which leads to the Paternoster gang investigating similar fire-based deaths. There's a good moment as both the Doctor and Clara wind up at a restaurant bickering like the old friends they are. It's fun and snappy, a slick way of establishing Clara's personality shift into being more of a control freak. Remember, she has been travelling with the Doctor for three years by this point, since she was 24 in The Bells of St John, and this episode establishes that she's now 27. It makes a lot of sense that during this period, her more bossy characteristics would begin to show up, especially as she gains the exaggerated swagger of a British time traveller. So this scene serves as a good way to introduce these new character traits, especially because it shows how well they work with and contrast the 12th Doctor's own. They both assume the other place the ad in the paper, which in turn leads to some comedic moments as they push each other's buttons, giving you a great glimpse into their instant chemistry as the leading duo. I also really enjoy the reveal that the other diners in the restaurant are actually robots. Well, that or they're just extras in any film or show ever. Seriously, take a look next time. This is what they do in the background. But for real, it's so eerie to watch the jerky and synchronised movements as these robots advance on the protagonists. It's like something out of a horror movie. Every time you take a step to leave, this group of fake humans slowly advances to the sound of gears and clockwork. Later dialogue implies that this has been an ongoing thing the robots trapping unwitting diners and stealing their organs, which is incredibly sinister and something you can imagine being the entire plot of a Doctor Who book or something, without the extra elements this story has. Even though it's such a small part of the restaurant scene, it's a really unsettling aspect to the wider episode, showing how impossible it is for these clockwork droids to ever truly be human. They're just too mechanical. Yes, let's talk about the so-called Half-Face Man, who is super creepy. He's this clockwork droid who is desperately trying to become human, kind of like a reverse Cyberman in a way. His mannerisms are so stunted and inhuman, which is made even freakier because of how almost human he looks. It's not quite the uncanny valley, but it's enough to creep you out because you get the distinct feeling that this robot will never look human no matter how hard he tries. Sure, he has skin and organs, but that's not what defines humanity. Although he does come close with this Arnie level one-liner. The restaurant is closed. The design of the Half-Face Man is really cool. A patchwork robot made up of body parts he's stolen by prowling the dark streets of London. It's a sinister premise and his mismatched body reminds me a lot of Auntie and Uncle from The Doctor's Wife. Everything is awkwardly cobbled together from uneven scraps, making him look even less human as a result. I do appreciate that Moffat makes sure to acknowledge the familiarity of the clockwork droid concept. All throughout the story, the Doctor is trying to work out where he's seen this before. But naturally, he can't remember, like with the Grey Intelligence back in The Snowman. It is a nice way to pay tribute to Moffat's second Doctor Who story, The Girl in the Fireplace, since the SS Mary Antoinette is the sister ship to the SS Madame de Pompadour from that episode. It's some excellent continuity and a great reference for fans to spot. I am a big fan of the SCP universe, and I can easily imagine the Half-Face Man existing within it. A robot so desperate to be human that it glues on bits and pieces is perfect, the entity lurking in the shadows under the delusion that it can somehow attain humanity through this sick and perverse method. Take this concept and put it in the dark, gloomy and mysterious streets of Victorian London and you've got a winner. It's beautiful Doctor Who steampunk goodness and I can't help but adore such a creation and the questions it poses, especially the parallels to the ship of Theseus. If you're not already familiar with the concept, the ship of Theseus dates back to ancient Greek mythology. After Theseus, the founder and king of Athens, slayed the Minotaur and freed the children of Athens, they all escaped on a ship to Delos. Every year after after that, the people of Athens would use the ship to take a pilgrimage to Delos to honour the god Apollo. However, as this practice continued and the ship was maintained throughout the years, with the oars and planks replaced with new wood, it begs the question, is it the same ship? That is the core of the Ship of Theseus thought experiment. If every part of the boat has been replaced one by one, does it remain the same ship Theseus himself travelled upon? It's a fascinating philosophical debate dating back to like the 1st or 2nd century and it continues to be discussed today, like in this episode. Well actually this one is the Trigger's Broom variation. This old broom has had 17 new heads and 14 new handles in its time. You are a broom. The Half-Face Man has changed so much about itself, stitching all of these body parts on and swapping out circuitry to maintain itself. 
This makes you wonder if any of the original robot is even there anymore. It's implied he's been doing this since the time of the dinosaurs, so is he a robot at all now? Is he a cyborg? Who knows, and that's part of why I love it so much, because it has so much depth as a concept. In a way, the half-faced man also serves as a bit of a parallel to the Doctor himself. The Doctor has regenerated so many times, replacing every cell in their body over and over again, so are they even the same person anymore? It's why Clara needs to accept the 12th Doctor because he is still the same, even though everything about him has changed. A big part of the episode is seeing how much of the Doctor is still there within this strange new man. After all, to quote Day of the Doctor, same software, different case. He may be different, every cell in his body may have changed, but his identity is still the Doctor, and he just needs Clara and the audience to see underneath the physical appearance. However, the episode makes sure to keep pushing the strange new darkness of the 12th Doctor. During his and Clara's escape from the Half-Faced Man, the Doctor leaves her behind. We barely know him anymore, so we don't know why he does this. It feels cold and callous and makes you genuinely fear for Clara because the Doctor she knew would never do this to her. Well, actually, he was pretty damn manipulative come to think about it. Anyway, what I mean is that this is a brand new Doctor and we don't know what he's capable of. It's very startling for him to put his companion in so much serious danger. Danger we see firsthand in a really intense scene. Indeed, in order to survive, Clara has to pretend to be a robot and hold her breath for a stupidly long amount of time, hence the title of the episode. Clara isn't an athlete or someone who has trained herself to hold her breath for ages, so I think it's fantastic attention to detail as her eyes start to water and her vision blurs as the oxygen is cut off from her brain. She is fighting all of her natural instincts until her body literally can't take it anymore, which is terrifying. It really humanises Clara and reminds you that Doctor Who companions are still people like you and I. They're not superheroes. It's a very tense scene that focuses on audio, with an emphasis on the ringing in Clara's ears and the ever-fading footsteps as her body becomes starved of oxygen. The sound design is masterful here and pulls you in with such an authentic feeling of immersion. I really like how we get to see a bit of a flashback to Clara starting out as a teacher. It was always a bit of a sudden change for some viewers of the show, but Series 8 makes her job a pivotal part of the show. It's good to both have this reminder whilst also showing you she wasn't always perfect and struggled to keep the annoying children under control. Honestly, you couldn't pay me enough to be a teacher. I hate children far too much. These difficulties actually fuel Clara as a character because she's able to draw on her experience and call the half-faced man's bluff. If you start off with the most severe threat, then every subsequent threat pales in comparison, so it makes your position weak. Never start with your final sanction. You got nowhere to go, but backwards. This is another way to show just how far Clara has come as a person. She's able to stand her ground much more confidently and effectively than she did towards the start of Series 7B. We've watched that growth over the course of her time on the show, and it plays into her wider arc of wanting to become like the Doctor. And then, after all the intrigue about who the Doctor is, he steps up, quite literally removing the mask of the 11th Doctor, since yeah, this is a prosthetic version of Matt Smith's face. Enjoy that thought when you sleep tonight. There's a bit of a fan belief in something called Doctor moments, specifically in debut episodes like this. It's always been hard to describe, but they're standout scenes of an incarnation stamping their authority on the role. Every introductory episode has one, and this is Deep Breath's version. The music swells into the 12th Doctor's theme and he swans about the room, immediately taking control of the situation and making threats towards the villains. It's such a triumphant scene. After 50 minutes of being edged by Moffat, it's the blissful release of the Doctor truly hitting full form. Ew. Did I really just say that? Ugh. Let's pretend that never happened. Deep Breath introduces a darker, more serious tone to Doctor Who. Moffat wanted to draw a direct contrast with the Smith era, which had a heavily fairy tale and whimsical vibe. That was all about being bombastic and magical. But Deep Breath immediately affirms that this is no longer the case. It's more of a gothic period drama with a gritty atmosphere and more grounded scenes, with chilling body horror. I mean, the half-faced man tries to make his escape in a hot air balloon made out of human skin. Just take a minute to think about that. It's a horrific visual when you actually take the time to imagine how many people must have been killed to make it possible. I'm surprised they were even allowed to broadcast this part because of how disturbing it is. Like, that's human skin. Stuff like this helps to punctuate that more serious direction for the show. 
something Moffat had already been trending towards with series 6 and 7. Rather than being about wacky misadventures and a flirty lead pairing, Deep Breath immediately establishes this quieter and more thoughtful tone, which is a welcome break from the usual action-oriented chaos of modern Doctor Who before this point. And of course, along with all of these tonal changes, there are a lot of other changes in production. The new credit sequence is very flashy, albeit a bit on the nose about the whole time aspect of the show. Most importantly, however, we get an updated TARDIS interior. It retains the industrial look of Series 7B, but there are some slight improvements, with different lighting and bookcases to make everything feel a bit more homely and welcoming, rather than it being too much of a space like it was for Smith. The Twelfth Doctor is a very dark and nuanced take on the character, and one of the best examples is him pouring a drink for himself and the half-faced man he is about to kill. This confrontation is absolutely fascinating. It's not the traditional setup of the Doctor shouting at the villain and threatening to stop them, instead it's a very thematic dialogue between two ancient characters grappling with their own identities. When this escape pod lifts off, you have the distinct feeling that only one of these men is going to come out alive. Sure, the green screening of the whole scene is a bit weak, but it's not a scene about the visuals. It's a scene about the two characters and what they're going to do to survive. It's really chilling when the Doctor implies that he lied about it being against his basic programming to kill, especially with that fantastic shot of the half-faced man impaled on Big Ben, or Elizabeth Tower for you pedantic commenters out there. It's the perfect prelude to that story arc of the Doctor wondering if he's a good man. Throughout the Moffat era, the character has been growing darker and darker in personality and actions, so moments like these are perfect to illustrate just how morally questionable he has become, flat out killing the villain like this. Of course, it is left somewhat ambiguous for the sake of the children, but we all know what this look means, and what Moffat was intending. It's a fascinating ending for the half-faced man, finally granting him that death he was refusing for so very long. And indeed, he does reach his promised land, in a brilliantly eerie final scene of him meeting Missy. I adore this introduction to the character, with her mentions of the Doctor being her boyfriend. Michelle Gomez is immediately standout with her few lines and stage presence, so it's a great sneak peek into the future of the series, and obviously I'll talk more about that when it's more relevant. The Doctor seems to yet again abandon Clara, continuing to emphasise 12 being so unfamiliar and unpredictable, leaving her just like he did back in the spaceship. It's an important thing to maintain because his darker nature is the ongoing story arc, so there still need to be some lingering doubts even after this episode. I don't think I know who the Doctor is anymore. Of course, this was a risky move because it could undo all that goodwill Moffat had managed to build up with the fans. But I actually think it was smart. He knew that the fans would still doubt Capaldi as the Doctor, so when the Doctor does return for Clara, there is a sense of nervousness and trepidation in the companion. It's like she's scared of him backing away around the console. However, this scene does recontextualise their relationship, with the Doctor himself admitting that Eleven and Clara were a bit more than friends, but that's no longer the case in his new incarnation. It's a quick way of telling you just how different things will be, along with easing Clara's concerns a little. The music swells up again as they both talk about the mysterious woman in the shop who gave Clara the Doctor's number, and wondering who put the ad in the paper, giving you hope for the two staying together. But just as this moment of triumph comes in, it immediately comes crashing down as Clara decides she would rather leave. It really crushes you seeing the disappointment in the Doctor's eyes, his best friend still treating him like a stranger. I feel so horrible for him because of how much he opened up to Clara throughout the episode, trying to be seen for who he really is. But that's once again where Moffat shines by doing one of the most genius and unexpected things he could have ever done for this narrative. So, the whole story is about the audience themselves not seeing the Doctor as the same person, right? It's all a meta deconstruction of modern fans' misconceptions about the character and teaching them to embrace the Doctor in different ways. But how do you really drive the point home? Well, you have the previous Doctor literally tell you to accept him. Yes, in a genius move by the Grand Moff, Clara receives a call from none other than the Doctor back on Trenzalore, explaining why the phone was off the hook back in that episode. It's wonderfully timey-wimey and also creates a brilliant bookend for Eleven and Clara, since their time together begins and ends with a phone call one of them wasn't expecting. I have no idea if that was actually intentional by Moffat, but it's a great way to bring things full circle. I love how the music from Time of the Doctor comes in here, really solidifying the bridge between Doctors and 
Bond episodes. I think it says a lot about the bond between the Doctor and Clara that Eleven knew she would need this call. He had the foresight to understand her struggle and it shows so much about the deep level of unconditional love and understanding they share. Indeed, the Eleventh Doctor reassures Clara that it's the same person. It's an unprecedented move to bring a Doctor actor back like this, even if it was filmed as part of Time of the Doctor. But like I said, it's crucial because Clara represents the audience. Everything he's saying to her, he's saying to the viewer. He's telling you not to be scared or put off by how different 12 is. It's basically Moffat pleading with the audience to give this a chance and not judge by appearances. This scene always chokes me up, not because of the cameo, but because of how vulnerable it shows the 12th Doctor to be. I'm not on the phone, I'm right here, standing in front of you. It's so emotional. He trusted Clara so much, she was his best friend, more than a friend. But now she won't even see that he's the same person. He is no longer wearing that youthful mask because of how much he trusts her. So Clara's rejection of that seriously breaks his heart. All he wants is to be seen and that's what the point of this moment is. It allows both Clara and the viewer to see the Doctor standing right there. He may be older, he may be darker and he may be Scottish, but he's still the Doctor and that's what everyone needs to see. It really gets to me that even after this whole episode and this scene tailored specifically for them, so many fans still rejected the 12th Doctor. Moffat did everything he possibly could, but the message still fell on a lot of deaf ears and that will always be the saddest part about this episode. Deep Breath didn't fail, the fans failed Deep Breath. You can't see me can you? You, you look at me and you, you can't see me. Deep Breath is a very low-key series opener, especially considering it's the debut of a whole new Doctor. It's not some big world-ending epic invasion story like the Christmas Invasion or the 11th Hour. Instead, it's all about the character dynamics. Everything with the dinosaur and the clockwork robots a backdrop to this very ponderous and philosophical narrative. And that's what makes it such an excellent premiere. The plot itself is strong, but secondary. The focus is on what's most important, and that's making the audience feel comfortable with the Doctor, using Clara as this surrogate for the viewer. The episode essentially holds a mirror up to the fans and forces them to confront their own prejudices about this new Doctor. Moffat introduces the new tone of the show brilliantly with this darker, more serious storytelling, and Peter Capaldi's performance is an immediate hit. He's so amazing throughout this episode, balancing the familiar wild and alien eccentricity of the Doctor with his own lovable dry wit and cynical sense of humour. Both Capaldi and Jenna Coleman are delightful in this episode, already displaying their standout chemistry together in a number of scenes ranging from humorous to heartbreaking. The Half-Faced Man is a sinister and compelling villain, raising a lot of philosophical questions and, in general, the whole episode is a smooth and fascinating ride. Deep Breath easily earns an A rank on the Series 8 tier list, kicking things off in style. One of the few criticisms I have is that outside of being there for familiarity, the Paternoster Gang don't really do much and feel quite detached from the plot, especially when they somehow come rappelling down from an invisible skylight in a spaceship hidden underground. But apart from that, Deep Breath is a phenomenal and criminally underrated opening episode of Doctor Who. It achieves everything it set out to do and establishes the 12th Doctor perfectly, setting out his nuanced characteristics and previewing all of the story arcs of the series. It could have been a little bit shorter, but then again, so could this review. So, with all of that said, I hope you enjoyed this painfully long video. If you've made it to the end here, then I'm sure that you like Deep Breath just as much as I do. And if you don't, I hope I managed to convince you to like it a little bit more. So, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye. And an extra special thank you to my Asbantium level patron, Fallon Cortez, my Platinum level patrons, Maximilian Foreman, and Nick's Games, and all of my Gold level patrons, Boots, Calvin, Daniel Shiloto, Francois AK Line Vortex, Herna Furzog, and Luke underscore SY. Thank you so much for your support.